welcome everyone to the St. Stephen's 6pm podcast. It's me, Josh, I'm the youth pastor here at St. Stephen's. Hi guys, it's me, I'm Vicky and I'm the youth intern here. We're back again. We knew that first episode was going to be a smash hit. So we just thought, give the people what they want and give them a second episode. <laughs> oh yeah. No, we are very happy if you've come back to join us and we do hope this is going to be a blessing for you guys. Yeah, definitely. And um, this is very much, um, this podcast is very much for the 6pm congregation. If you don't normally come, that's also great. But it's we want to have to do something that has a bit more of an identity for that group who we know we don't get our service anymore so we want to have a little community and hopefully a podcast can be really helpful and we really want to get into some depth we are studying philippians and we're trying to cover all the themes and all the bits we're not doing every single verse we're hoping to basically try and cover every theme and aspect of the book and we really want it to be a challenge that causes change and we want to see all of us be transformed in our faith and the way we think and relate to God. We want to be changed and transformed in our hearts, change who we are in the way God is molding us, and we want to change in action, to change how we live as a result of these other changes. And I think Philippians is such a good book to do that because it's challenging and really is speaking into maturity and what it looks like to be a mature Christian. And this is now the second instalment. So exciting. So we're going to look now at a chunk from I guess it's like the second part of Philippians 2 um, we are going to do verses well 12 to 14 and then the second part of 18 to 26 this is all kind of on one theme we're going to miss out a bit in the, in the middle you can read that bit for yourselves if you think we're skipping over a good bit but I thought this kind of helps us to stay a bit more focused on one theme of Paul in this middle bit uh, have you got any background you want to give us Vicky you're our theologian over here you're our uh, our smart our smarty pants so oh, any, no. any, background, any background you want to give us for this section? Yeah, why not? Um, so we're kind of moving in, obviously, by now. Um, hopefully you'll know that Paul's in prison. Not exactly the best place to be, um, you think, when you're trying to advance the kingdom of God. Suddenly him and Silas have found themselves here. Um, and actually, that question, doesn't it? It's like, but how is this? And... It kind of starts off, and so we have actually, so any major centre um, that's kind of like under Roman influence um, had an imperial guard, um, as was the case um, in Ephesus, where most likely Paul and Silas are. And um, yeah, and I think for us in our society, we think it's hard to picture um, we have the Queen and we have government, but um, somebody that's that... Um, kind of regimented in how you think and you act and you live your life um so yeah so here we meet Paul again and yeah Paul is chatting about Jesus which is coming up against this imperial guard everyone now knows that he's a Christian everyone who's of influence so yeah that's how we meet him advancing the kingdom basically he's very much in prison not because he stole something or burgled someone's house but because he was talking about Jesus and as you were saying in, in that city, in the Roman Empire, if you don't conform to what the culture is, their religious, political beliefs, if you speak out against it, if you challenge it, you're in prison. That's it. We don't want you speaking out. We're going to shut you off. Which is very interesting now for what the context of this verse is. Totally, yeah. And you can actually find, it's in Acts uh, 16 again, I think, where um, you, yeah, you find out why Paul and Silas are in prison. So should we read our, our bit? Go for it. So I'm going to start at 12, like I said, and then read to 14, and then I'm going to jump to the second part of 18, and then read to 26. And as always, it's from the NIV. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a re result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains... Most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. There's now they're jumping to that bit in 18. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will no, in no way be ashamed, 
but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labour for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you, again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. That is an amazing and challenging bit of scripture. Yeah, it's like mic drop. And a classic quotable, classic, I always think of them as like fridge magnet verses. To live is Christ, to die is gain. It's the classic. Yeah. So we should, should we start off? Should we dig into this? Let's go for it. So I think from our intro, and I, I don't know if, if I did this on purpose or by accident, but that there's that interesting moment. It's obviously he's been pris- in, put in prison to shut him up, but he is celebrating that actually they're putting him in prison has meant that more people are feeling confident about proclaiming the gospel. Yeah, it's a weird one, isn't it? I think that's the thing. Initially, you read this and you just go, but Paul, how on earth could this be advancing the kingdom? But yeah, kind of what I've mentioned, um, he is doing just that. And that is just incredible. Um, And it actually says, um, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else, that I am in chains for Christ. Um, yeah, and again, as we kind of just touched on this, that that's huge, um, especially like we said, um, there's imperial guards and they actually acted as the gospel for Caesar originally. So here in our context, they are spreading uh, the supposed good news of of this ruler. Um, and then actually Paul comes along and he starts so it going, um, no, 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 actually Jesus, like king of all. Um, So yeah, it's big, really big. And yeah, I just love everyone knows about it. I think that's great. (laughs) Yeah, he's a chatterbox, isn't he? (laughs) Or as right at the end, as we read, he says he's, he's, it's boasting, which seems crazy, but it's very interesting. And like, this is one of the big bits. And I almost think, are we jumping into this too early that his situation is bad but the outcome is good. And so he is very happy about it. And not the outcome of his situation, but what his situation has done for his biggest goal. And we were talking about that in the last episode of like, actually, we need to have this completely different vision, this completely different take on what our lives are for. And actually it's who they're for. And we talked about actually taking our eyes off of ourselves and looking internally and pushing ourselves forward and having lives that the, our dream and our hope is that our lives are going to have this outcome that God is going to be glorified and very much in this case by the sharing of the good news of God. And he's actually, he seems pretty chilled about the prison bit because he's just like, it's totally worth it. Totally. I think, kind of as you we jumped from verses 18 onwards um sometimes we read it and it feels like Paul is is jumping all over the place and he's kind of stuck going um like he says a lot of like to life and to death and to live and to die and he go back and forth and it's like do I do this or do I do this or do I do that um but actually um I don't think it's like that at all he he's kind of saying um I'm doing all right. This is for the kingdom. So no matter what happens here, it's either for the kingdom to preach the good news here on earth or I die and I'm going to heaven and I'm with Jesus. Um, Which is just, yeah, it's incredible to think um, what he's actually going through. I definitely would not be saying what Paul's saying right now if I was in the same position. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I I think instantly... Well, he is an amazing practical example in this of, A, last week we talked about, like he said, have this high value. And then he's like, I'm not just saying it, I'm living it. Like he wants to, he talks about, uh, have, he talks about his body, doesn't he? Can I, which bit is that in? I'm going to look at 20 and he says, Christ will be exalted in my body. That's what he says. And 
he, he wants to basically make his whole being a sacrifice for God. He puts it, he putting, he's putting his life on the line and almost very much imitating Jesus in that. Like he, he knows, right, our ultimate example is Jesus. Jesus had, had wanted to reconcile. He wanted to bring man and God back together where there was a rift, there was a break in their relationship. Jesus gives up his life. He gives up his body literally on the cross to, to reconcile to bring God and man back together, to pay the price of our wrongdoing, our rebellion against God. And so Paul is very much saying, if Jesus did it, well, I'm going to do it too. I'm going to follow in his footsteps. I give myself up for the kingdom of God. He's he's living it out there. Totally. I think it's so interesting because Paul um, is really um well versed and um very well knowledge of rhetoric rhetoric being like the art of persuasion almost and that's exactly from the very get-go of writing this letter that is just so what he's doing so he's done this this is who i am i'm so thankful for you guys but then he goes but this is my like proposition and i think the best way to, i mean to persuade somebody is to go but like look at me or look at this here as an example and you're so right he goes Jesus is the the best example, but here this is what I'm living right now. This is the example, and this is my proposition to you guys. Yeah, and it's and it's amazing because in this first bit, the thing which he's loving is his teaching and his example has then inspired everyone else. Because I was thinking, and it's kind of struck me right now as I'm like, because it says you are. This is verse fourteen. He says. You become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. And I thought I just written a big. Why? Because my initial reaction was like, oh, so you see someone get arrested and be in trouble for it. So that would make me go, oh, there are real consequences for this. But actually, his like vision and his to follow God has inspired them to follow in his footsteps. He's like that vision to see people proclaim the kingdom, proclaim the good news about Jesus, to want to see people get saved. Even with the consequences, that vision has actually inspired people to follow in his footsteps. It's amazing. So incredible. Yeah. And that's made it even more worth it. But it comes down to that bit, doesn't it, I guess, of to say that's such a challenge to say, actually, is the kingdom of God worth all of those sacrifices? Like you come back to um, Romans 12, 2. Hang on. No, it's 12, 1. Let me look this up quickly. As it says in Romans 12, and it's verse 1, it says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And it's that idea that we men have put all our own desires to the side. And this is that moment. And he says, to the extreme of to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I, he's like the only reason to live. He's like, he's so singularly focused to say the only reason to live is Christ. Yeah, it's so amazing. It's such a challenge because it makes me realise how rubbish I am at that. I mean, I think... There's just such a level of trust here as well, isn't there? Of him just going, Lord, even in the fact that I am imprisoned, I trust that this is going in the way you want it to go. Like I'm trusting that you are still in control and I'm trusting that you're still advancing the kingdom, even when actually for him, it's really rubbish and it's really horrible. This verse 20, isn't it? He says... I hope that I'll in no way be ashamed. So that it's like, right, I've got trust that this is all for the all for good. And then to top it all off, because of this I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. <laughs> it's so great, isn't it? And I think and and one of the things I'm I'm really focused on, often we can think, you know, as a Christian, our goal is to be good and have an impact in the world for good. And actually that should be a symptom. It's for the person that is Jesus. When we are not the same as other people who have a motivation to do good, we are not the same because it's not for the sake of doing good, it's for the sake of Jesus. Like that is the core part. We are, as Christians, we are meant to be focused on the person of Jesus and his kingdom and his reigning and and for his his way to you know his kingdom come and his will be done as the Lord's Prayer says. It's about the person. It's not, we don't, we're not jumping straight to the, because we want to have a good impact in the world. It's about the person. I think that's really important. And so let's talk, let's talk about this single focus, because I think that is so hard, isn't it? Huge. 
Yeah. And it's, it's so funny when I've been, th- I've, I've felt really challenged on this recently, but I have been realizing my inner monologue, my, my, my inner like desires. Like I, I'm someone who loves to think about the future. I love to picture what the world could be. And all of my desires are pointing in the direction of comfort. Like I, I rent a room at the moment, but I just walk around Twickenham and just look at the beautiful houses. And I just dream of being able to live in one of those houses and have, like have a garden where it's just for me and live in, you know, and actually in a place that's as beautiful as this. And I'd love to go on holiday. Like at the moment, who's dreaming of going on a holiday? Like I'm just dreaming to get, I love going to America as everyone knows, getting out and going on a road trip and feeling free and all of that stuff. I just picture in my mind comfort all the time or I picture success all the time. Like this is not me putting on someone's, like this is me. I love, I'm, I'm picturing comfort. And actually Paul is so focused on Christ that he has given up so much comfort like to be in a prison not even one of our prisons in the UK which would be hard to be in but a Roman prison which must be so uncomfortable but he is so focused on Jesus that he is willing to give up comfort it's just incredible isn't it I'm so the same I'm with you like I'm dreaming of dreaming of my holiday um I'm just dreaming of always dreaming of the next thing I think I'm always dreaming of the next comfort of the next you know again a house and then it's dreaming of what that would look like and then it's dreaming of um a higher job and all of these things um and I just love the line um it's verse 20 again as always Christ will be exalted in my body whether by life or by death it's like I think there's nothing more powerful than just saying it's not about me It's it's just not about me it's just about the kingdom of God. And that is just, I mean, it's just so challenging, isn't it? Yeah, it's big time. And I think even if you think about our current situation in, you know, COVID lockdown, how many of us are thinking, I can't wait to get out of this. But actually, what, one in four British people have now tuned into an online church service? How many, how many of us are now able to start building relationships with our neighbours, who I imagine most of them aren't Christian? Are, so, are we going, you know, coronavirus, the virus itself is bad, but actually, it's so worth it because the outcome of this is we are being able to spread the gospel. Like, you know, I think Katie said in her talk um, on the first bit, like we are very similar to Paul. Like he, he might be in an actual prison or he might be locked in his home. But either way, he's like lock, he's in lockdown, isn't he? And actually, he, he can relate, but it's much worse for him. But he's saying it's worth it because the kingdom is being built. And I wonder how many of us are thinking the situation is bad, but it's worth it because of the gospel opportunities. Uh, Vicky, I'm not, and I'm, that is not my instinct. But actually, what do we have this attitude that says, oh my goodness, gospel is bigger, and so therefore lockdown is worth it. Obviously, the virus, the death is really, really bad, but in our situations, I wonder how many of us are thinking, there's an opportunity here, amazing. What a, what a great season. Like, no one, no one's thinking that. So how do, we, how do we move in that direction of really giving our lives over to Jesus what does it look like for us as like individuals and as a community as you talked a lot about in the last episode about partnership yeah totally I love again this whole rejoicing I just mentioned it and I just think that's just it's just beyond words of how I could ever imagine me rejoicing in that situation Um, but yeah if you listened to last episode we chatted about partnership and what that really means in this context Um, and I think again rejoicing is such a big one as well again I said uh kind of joy and rejoicing um a lot of the time is kind of used independent of the situation um and that's huge I think um to kind of look beyond that and to choose joy and to choose to walk alongside God every day is is hard during times and seasons and life and oh my goodness, do I think I have to pray that prayer every day of like, Lord, your will be done today. Yeah, I just pray for that, for that guidance. But yeah, like we said about that partnership, it's about doing it with others, isn't it? Like asking for help, praying together. Um, that fellowship, again, doing life together. Um, I mean, yeah. And we can only hope to do a tiny bit of what Paul's doing here. <laughs> I I think there's a I think that's that's really that's really good, Vicky. Is looking for the looking for the joy, looking for the gratitude, and as you say, I think it's it's that prayer. It's like pressing into Jesus. If it's about the person of Jesus as the main thing, we have to be pressing into Jesus. That's got to be the biggest thing. And I and I, and I think 
there's a there's a challenge of repentance. I mean, we almost have to repent from our own. We have to re- review the, our monologue, our dreams, our desires, and be re- be ready to repent of them and say, do you know what? Actually, I track my inner monologue. And it's a desire for comfort, it's a desire for success, whatever it is, and start saying, actually, God, that's putting myself first. Or even actually, maybe this is deep and it's challenging, or we have goals for our family, and actually investing in your family is big time, but saying, actually, that becomes second below serving God, and then our families come as part of that investing in them. But to say, actually, I need to have this thing, this goal, this outlook that says, I'm following you, Jesus, and spending time saying, God, show me where you're working in this, and also... I give up my plans. This is something I've been having to do recently is giving up my plans to say, I've been making these plans around comfort. I've been making these plans around this life I want to lead. And I have to give them up, say, God, I want to go where you take me. Like not to live is live in America, like which is one of my dreams to live in California, to live is California and to die is rubbish. No, I need to like start going, no, God, you can take me where you want to take me. And those decisions, those steps I'm going to take, and be, be willing to give up more of that stuff we hold valuable and to say, God, come into that space and, and then you show me where to go. What's the kingdom choice in, when we're making a job or where we're living or, you know, how we're spending our vacation or whatever it is. And we've got to stick close to God if we're going to hear his voice because it's about the person of Christ. It's not about the outcome ultimately. Yeah, I think that's just amazing. And I am so challenged by it. Um, for anyone who knows me, you'll know that I'm an absolute control freak. So part of my journey is going, Lord, your plan, not mine. But even then I'm going, no, but I really want, I, I'm still planning. Um, and that is such a huge challenge for me because I want to put my trust in that. And I want to put my trust in my plans and, um, build that up for myself. Um, and it's something that I've totally had to be like, no, Lord, you're leading the way which is really hard um and there's also been times I'm big fan of like doing gratitude journals and writing out my gratitude um because there's been a time where it was actually like a okay lord you're gonna have to show me something to be grateful for because I can't actually see what I'm grateful for right now because it was such a tough situation and yeah and some days that was like the tiniest thing because it was a real stretch um, and other days it's it's loads of things um but yeah I think walking alongside God in that every day um I think it's praying that prayer like that kingdom prayer I think that Paul is so incredible out of going I'm seeing it in this like kingdom lens almost and it's being like Lord show me my day show me the future in your kingdom lens um and it's and that's really tough big time and I, and I think it's it's that you see that often like spending time with God and you know you can often put that in like prayer of talking to God and contemplative prayer and listening to God and reading a Bible can often become this like chore we're meant to do as Christians but actually we need to be coming from a place where like we're this passionate about God that of course we want to spend time with him it's meant to come from this like love and desire to follow God and I think that's one of the things I've been trying to work on is not just going here we go again. I'm eating my breakfast with my Bible. I've got to do this, but going, changing where our hearts are at. And maybe it's a it, part of our prayers is like, change my heart, change my desire, God. But to know actually, if my desire is to follow Christ, I therefore need to then invest in that place. Coming from a place of love and desire, not from a place of like duty or purely routine or obligation. Yeah, definitely. And it's hard because the reality is some days, some days, are like that some days it is just that intentional act of despite not how I'm feeling I'm gonna do it anyway and spend that time um but yeah it's all isn't it it's so hard because it's all about where our heart is at and wanting to spend time with God despite the circumstance that we're in just because we love it and we love him yeah I think that's that's so important because love is not always about feeling it like you know I'm an engaged man now but I'm not quite a married married man but I'm I'm picturing like I actually when I'm married I need to be someone who is like day in day out there for Laura not today's the day I feel it and so therefore I'll be generous to you you want you, you know you want to live a good chunk of it on like I feel it I appreciate you I'm having a nice time but you then when the feeling is gone you don't do it that's not actually what love is it's meant to be it's like a commitment isn't it it's like a, a heart posture that says, or, or it's a life posture that says 
I will make the choice for you. And then within that, you're looking, you're asking God to show you and in those intimacy, like change my heart, draw me closer to you and point to me what you're doing. I think even as you were saying about gratitude, gratitude is taking a moment to say, God, what are you working in and what are you doing? And I think, I think that is crucial in this because you can so easily just say the things I've lost, but you've got to actually say, God, what are you doing in this particular this moment right now? Look for the good things. Yeah. Challenging. <laughs> Definitely. Well, Vicky, to finish us up, do you want to... Do you want to pray for us? And I, I think it's like praying in that like repentance and that desire to have our heart changed. And just that like God will, you know, be working on our desires and our priorities to follow him and make him the centre of what we do and our, our choices in our lives. Totally. I'd love to. Let's pray. Uh, yeah, Lord, I thank you so much for this time. And I thank you for this challenge. Um, and Lord, I just ask that now that you would come to us and our, our listeners, that you would um, show us our things that we are putting our, our hope and our desires in um, and our trust in um, that's not you, Lord. Um, and Lord, I just ask that you would just come and in this time that you would just really show us um, what we have to be grateful for. But Lord, you would draw close to us and you would really change our hearts, Lord, for that kingdom posture and um, to be able to see things and have those desires with those that kingdom mindset, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you. And thanks everyone at home who's been listening. I say at home, I hope you're doing some exercise maybe. You might be driving, who knows? Thanks so much for listening, everyone, and we'll see you on the next episode. See you later.